starts right now. A third person has died after that deadly drag racing crash in Kerrville. A 46 year old woman pronounced dead today from the injuries she, she sustained along with the two children who lost their lives during that drag racing event. Tonight, the Kerrville community hosting a prayer vigil. Our John Paul Barajas joins us live there this evening. John Paul. Steve, Myra, that prayer vigil is set to start at 630. And as you mentioned, uh, more the lives lost that is now up to three people now here at Flat uh, Rock Park. We're still waiting for more people to show up, but it's about 30 minutes till that prayer vigil is scheduled to start. So more people should be coming up and showing up shortly. Now, according to police on Saturday, 27 year old racer Michael Gonzalez's car lost rear tire traction and crashed into a group of spectators. Six year old Daniel Trujillo Jones and eight year old Santiago Martinez passed away that day. Six others were hospitalized, one of them being 46 year old Rebecca Cedillo, who has since passed away as well. I will be here throughout the evening covering the prayer vigil and tonight at 10 we will bring you the latest from those in attendance in Kerrville. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. Guilty of murdering his wife. That's the verdict the jurors handed down to Louis Benevento, who is now convicted of killing his wife, Alicia Wells. Right now, the jury is deliberating his sentence. The crime happened back in May of 2019. According to Benevento, who took the stand today in his own defense, he claims they got into an altercation. And when he tried to leave the situation, Wills pointed a gun at him first. So then he shot her. That's his side of the story. There is security video, though, that contradicted that story. Again, he was found guilty. He faces up to 99 years in prison. The anti-Semitic flyers and protests that we showed you yesterday setting the stage for a tragic anniversary today. Three years ago, 11 members of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh were killed in what's been called the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in the nation's history. Our Jesse DeGoyato takes us to San Antonio's Holocaust Memorial Museum devoted to the millions of lives lost. A photo of an old woman with a Jewish star is especially meaningful to Nami Ikalov. And the reason it speaks to me is because I am a second generation survivor. There's a room lined with photos of family members donated by other second generation survivors living in San Antonio. Almost every artifact at the Holocaust Museum, many of them disturbing to see even now, also were donated by members of San Antonio's Jewish community. We don't want to be the best kept secret in town. Especially not when anti-Semitic flyers and protests show up around this time of year, when Nami Ikalov says the Holocaust was stoked by the indifference of bystanders during an infamous night of terror in Poland, which is why he says the museum is founded on not being a bystander. Instead, being an upstander means you're not going to stand idly by and allow those things to happen. The executive director says coming here could educate and inspire someone to counteract anti-Semitism by educating and inspiring others. I'm a 30-year educator and I believe that education can really be the silver bullet that will move us forward. Thanks to volunteers pushing for the legislation in 2019, its history is being taught in Texas public schools during Holocaust Remembrance Week in late January. Students will learn more and more and hopefully be the kind of human beings that we want running our future. Jesse de Goyado. KSAT 12 News. It was a bumpy ride for the city council today as they took the next step in advancing the $1.2 billion bond program they have before them. The five year program, a chance for council members and residents to see big projects completed in their districts. Gary Berger tells us what led to some hot debate about needs and wants during today's council session. Garrett joins us live. All right, Garrett, what was this all about? Well, after staff had presented their original recommendations for the bond program two weeks ago, several council members had said they wanted to see more emphasis on the basics like streets and drainage. So today, city staff adjusted their recommendations, shifting around nearly $58 million, more than half of which would go towards streets and drainage projects. Now, to find that money, city staff recommended a variety of cuts, including to the city's trail system. Now, the original proposed funding for developing the city's Howard WP Greenway trail system was 126 million. Staff recommended today cutting that down to 110 million. However, some council members wanted even deeper cuts, going down to as far to as little as 50 million in order to free up more money for streets and drainage. Now there were two failed attempts in close cuts or in close votes with the council to cut the trail system budget amid some spirited debate. 
to pitch this to my community as something that takes precedent over drainage streets and sidewalks is extremely out of touch. Uh, and um, I, I encourage that you all come out of your gated communities um, and into um, District 5 to see what our, our communities have to have to deal with on the day to day. Ultimately, council approved just the shifts that city staff had recommended, but there's still a long ways to go in the but in the bond program with a series of citizen advisory committees, then back to council and ultimately to city voters in the May election. Now, the citizen advisory committees are actually starting their meetings tonight. These are open to the public and you can find the full schedule on the city's website. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thanks, Garrett. Let's take a look outside with live cam today. The word today is wind. My goodness, it is a gusty day out there. <laughs> yeah, very gusty today. And although the wind is going to subside a little bit tonight, it's just going to ramp up again tomorrow. So anticipate another windy day tomorrow. Keep your Halloween decorations secured, especially the inflatables deflated during the day. So today we picked up about an inch of rain at the airport, 0.98. Pretty much an inch of rain from those thunderstorms earlier this morning. Let's take a look at other rain gauge reports. Bernie 0.88, Leon Valley just over an inch. You get to Sutherland Springs over half an inch. Even Stinson Airport picked up about two thirds of an inch. Randolph, Seguin over an inch as well. So it was a good quick hit of rainfall earlier this morning. Temperatures now in the 70s and still 80 degrees in spots. Stinson and Pleasanton both around 80 degrees, but for the most part 70s. We have some headlines to talk about. Another gusty day, jackets at the bus stop, humidity is gone for now. More specifics coming up. All right, we'll see you in a bit. Thanks, Adam. New at six, a new way of facilitating foster care has launched in parts of South Texas. A newly created nonprofit called Belong is now working with foster children and their families. Belong will serve 27 counties surrounding Bear County. It's an expansion of what's called community based foster care. Instead of child protective services, finding foster placements for kids removed from their homes, Belong will now be responsible for that, working with other local organizations to make it happen. The nonprofit SJRC Texas, which has been a foster care provider for decades, is now contracting with the state to run Belong. One of the goals of community based model care is to keep kids close to home. Not move them out of state or to a, you know, a, a place far away, because the hope is that they'll be able to work community services, partner and stay in the same school system, and then ultimately, if it's a safe environment, go back home, because we know that kids have better long-term outcomes when they stay in their county and city of origin with their family of origin. Belong will serve an estimated 675 children across those 27 counties. Community based care launched in Bear County several years ago, run by the nonprofit Family Tapestry. That's a division of the Children's Shelter. But the contract between Family Tapestry and the state was terminated earlier this year after some disturbing allegations were made involving children. All of this, the focus of an episode of KSAT Explains. We break down how the foster care system is supposed to work and examine what's gone wrong, plus what all of us can do to help with that. You can watch that episode on demand anytime at KSAT.com slash explains. Now to a place that's dealing with their own surge. A local psychiatric and substance abuse hospital is dealing with a surge of admissions. Laurel Ridge Treatment Center attributes this to the increase in mental health needs in the community due to COVID-19. Tiffany Huertas has more on how they're adjusting and what other facilities across the country are also facing. We have had at times where we're on uh, at full capacity. Jacob Quayar, the CEO of Laurel Ridge Treatment Center, says this influx of patients is due to COVID-19. So we do have individuals who are waiting uh, and pending a bed um, for placement. But we saw a three times uh, rate of increase um, in depression. We've seen about a 30 percent in increase in anxiety related disorders and a very significant increase in um, what we call deaths from despair. Last year, they opened a new hospital across the street from their facility. We saw several indicators that were going to suggest that we're going to have 
an elevation in the need for behavioral health care treatment. And so we opened our new hospital in October of last year, and it's at full capacity. Cuellar says they hired about 100 staff members to help with this influx of patients. Sean Coughlin, the president and CEO of the National Association for Behavioral Health Care, says facilities across the country are facing several issues, including dealing with workforce shortages. There is uh, clearly an, an increased demand and need for our services, um, and it's absolutely running head first into these workforce issues. Coughlin says it's been challenging for people seeking services. The people need access to these services, and we're finding they're just being delayed or cannot find those or cannot find access. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Investigators sifting through 600 pieces of evidence to get to the bottom of the deadly film set shooting involving actor Alec Baldwin. Why officials say it's possible criminal charges could be filed. Plus, the high cost of energy during that February freeze is still costing customers. How a local congressman is hoping a proposed bill will prevent price gouging during emergencies. It is something that puts a lot of family budgets in a bind. So many parents can relate to this. We have a story about this we're working on for the night beat at 10. Our Stephanie Jimenez in the newsroom with a breakdown of what else we have cooking as well. Stephanie. Well, yeah, that's right. Child care is just costing families way too much, and that's why it's out of reach for others. So tonight we're going to take a really close look at the problem as families get real about some of the sacrifices that they've had to make. Also, people experiencing homelessness usually don't have the resources to do things like take a shower, get medical care, or even get a vaccine. Now, tonight on The Night Beat, we're going to discuss the new program that hopes to change that to provide care for that very vulnerable population. So we have that and so much more coming up tonight on The Night Beat. Myra, I'll send things back to you. All right, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, CPS Energy customers could see a rate increase to pay a $1 billion bill due to natural gas price hikes from that February freeze. That's prompted Congressman Joaquin Castro to introduce a bill to stop price gouging during emergencies. Our Sarah Acosta finds out, if passed, what that could mean for you. February storm caused major shortages to the natural gas supply chain and prices skyrocketed by 10,000 percent. It's why Congressman Joaquin Castro introduced a bill today that would prevent natural gas price gouging during a declared emergency. If that emergency comes around, it's going to help keep the bill, uh, bills lower uh, through limiting the extent to which natural gas sales can, ex um, can accelerate um, in these various marketplaces. Dr. Taylor Collins, the economic chair at the University of Incarnate Word, says if passed, yes, this would benefit consumers from seeing those prices in the future end up on their utility bills. However, he says it's not fixing the root causes. But those underlying problems are still there and still do expose us to blackouts that come from extreme weather environments like this. A professor at Trinity University agrees. He says it's a Band-Aid solution. He believes the focus needs to be on winterizing equipment to prevent the supply shortage in the first place. That's really what they should be doing, right? Making sure we got enough supply of gas during uh, winter storms rather than capping the price. It's still uncertain if CPS Energy customers will be paying for those natural gas price hikes from February. CPS Energy is more than likely to propose a rate increase in the near future. The latest working estimate is around 8.2%. It's important to note that not all of that rate increase is from the winter storm. Some of it is from overdue customer bills and also much needed infrastructure upgrades. Now, any rate increase from CPS Energy would have to be approved by City Council. I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. If that bill were to pass, it would be up to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission to determine what would be the ceiling limit on natural gas prices. Some delays on area roadways this evening. Yeah, here's our Samuel King with a look at traffic. Sam, Daniel, we've been all been talking to Stephen Meyer about how traffic seems to be back, and we're seeing uh, that here in I-10 near downtown. A crash there at I-10 at Frio causing some uh, big delays. We'll take a closer uh, look at that. You see crews still on the scene here. One lane on the right side uh, blocked off as you're coming away from downtown, the lower level at I-10. So here's what's that doing your travel time. Also have some delays in I-10 uh, just north of Loop 410. So it's going to take you 50 minutes if you're heading out to Bernie uh, right now on I-10. And then inside 
uh, loop 1604, 37 minutes, 22 minutes uh, heading inbound. And now let's take a look at some other uh, big issues that we have. This is in Comal County on 35, just outside of New Braunfels. A crash here at 35 and Schwab. So you're down to 13 miles per hour heading southbound. So if you're coming into town from New Braunfels, 37 minutes now, a little bit better than it was, 32 minutes heading the other direction. Coming up in the next half hour, we'll have some more on some construction in that area tonight. It also might add to those delays on 35. Stephen Meyer. Thank you, Samuel. Meanwhile, let's turn to the weather situation. And I happen to notice he's lowering some temperatures in the forecast. Ooh. And down a notch here. I'm yeah. listening. Okay. Yeah, you're watching. I know Myra's lo looking <laughs> forward to this. This is uh, Myra Arthur Mornings on the right. way. Trade market. Ready for it, Myra? Whoosh. <laughs> there we go. Oh, and they have sound effects. Would you, would you call them Mornias? What? No, I don't no, know. no, that doesn't really work. <laughs> oh, okay. Hashtag right. morning. What? I don't know. <laughs> Minings. Hey, turn his mic <laughs> off. Mining. Okay, just turn hey, it off from now. Effort. You're the one that called him Myra Morning. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I give you, I give you credit for trying. You know, it's we gotta go there. You gotta try. Otherwise, nothing happens. Ever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, yeah. <laughs> What's trying to say? <laughs> Oh, 50 degrees, then we'll be in the 40s, Friday 47, Saturday 46. And keep in mind, these are for basically in San Antonio, cooler in some outlying areas, and I'll get to those details in a moment. I'll break it down for you neighborhood by neighborhood. But let's talk about the wind today, too. Very gusty. Looking at the whole state, we're all feeling it. It's actually good for energy generation with all the wind turbines you have in West Texas and up toward the Panhandle. This is good weather for the renewables and of course the solar uh, winds are gusting in excess of 30 miles per hour across the state and the wind will subside a little bit tonight, but then pick up again as we get into tomorrow. Most recent gusts Hondo 33 miles per hour, New Braunfels 28. We're already starting to see the gusts begin to fall off a little bit compared to where they were earlier today. Tonight, gusts to about 15 to 20. But by tomorrow, we ramp it back up again during the heat of the day, bright sunshine and wind gusts about 35 miles per hour. By Friday, not quite as gusty, just a little breeze periodically. Here's the big system, the big picture. This upper level trough, this disturbance stretches all the way from Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico. Severe weather associated with it in the plains yesterday, parts of Texas as well, and even northern Bear County and just north of San Antonio early this morning, and then still a tornado watch box around New Orleans. It's big dip in the upper level flows helping to stir things up. We're now on the back side of it. We've cleared out. We're going to have nothing but sunshine tomorrow all the way through Halloween. But you saw that stout line of storms earlier this morning woke a lot of us up, woke our kids up. Of course, at the worst time, just, you know, an hour before the alarm for school and the bus stop, could not have time to get to sleep. You know what I'm talking about? Anyway, it's out of here. We don't have any storms to worry about anytime soon. Uh, temperatures, though, they're going to take a bit of a hit. We talked about those mornings. So already down to 69 in Fredericksburg, Kerrville 72, Catula, 83. You see the warmer temperatures down to the south, but we're all going to level off a bit more. So let's fast forward to tomorrow morning when it will be 49 in Uvalde, 47 Canyon Lake, 42 in Fredericksburg to start the day. Meanwhile, 53 in Catula at the bus stop tomorrow. You want to have long sleeves or a jacket ready for the kids because Leon Springs 49, Bernie 47, even New Braunfels about 49 degrees at the bus stop in the morning and downtown San Antonio only about 51. By the afternoon, bright sunshine and temperatures well into the 70s, just pushing 80 degrees, especially Von Army, Elmendorf, Lavernia, 78, 79 for your high temperatures. And very gusty again tomorrow. We'll have those winds, as I mentioned, steady at 20 to 25, but gusting periodically up to 35 miles per hour. And humidity, you're not even going to think of it. It's gone all the way through Halloween. And notice those highs, mid upper 70s. By Halloween, we get into the low 80s. But for trick or treating weather, I think we'll mostly be in the mid and upper 70s. I'm going to text you guys tomorrow morning and say good, good morning. Good morning. Good, good my, yeah. morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I don't even remember uh, what it was. Greg is like, what are you guys even talking about here? I was in on it a little bit. Yeah, they're, they're Myra right. type mornings, I so we're trying you. to, you know, morn you. We're forcing it minus. and it's not working, yeah. basically. I got you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you never know what catches on. All right.
They want to make sure this guy stays happy. Talk about Jeff Trader, and I, uh, if you look deep into this, it's more about – what his team needs as far as improvements are concerned. Of course, he's going to get more money in this yeah. deal with his name being mentioned with Texas Tech, but I think he's more concerned about what team improvements can come by because they're getting ready to move into a bigger, better conference. We come back, he'll address this for the very first time since his name has been mentioned as a Red Raiders head coach. And KSAT, Texas Sports Production Game of the Week. Coming up. UTSA's head football coach and the school administration are working on a new contract and team improvements to keep Jeff Trailer as their head coach. That's according to Trader today, who met with the media for the first time since his name has been mentioned in the search for a new head coach of Texas Tech. The Red Raiders fired Matt Wells on Monday. Immediately, Trailer's name and that of SMU head coach Sonny Dykes came up in reports on who Texas Tech would go after to succeed Wells. But if you listen to Trailer today, it sounds like he's committed to staying at UTSA. President Amy and Dr. Compost have been in front of this for a while. Uh, they've been very active in their conversations with me this entire year. Um, we're just working through some details. You know, we're trying to get some things, you know, finalized and uh, so we can move forwards together. I've got agents and attorneys and they've got attorneys and there's just always legal language and there's stuff we're just working through, uh, to be very honest with you. And as we said last night, as Trailer said today, these are good problems to have. It means you are having success. And that would be an understatement this year with the Roadrunners 8 on on their bye week, nationally ranked at number 23 in the country. How do the players feel about hearing their coach's name pop up in that Texas Tech vacancy? We see it as a violation of the cheese code, so we don't try to get too much into that. So, um, you know, we just, we're just going to keep on doing what we're doing and, uh, you know, not really looking too, look into that too much. Uh, we have a whole season to keep on playing and we still got a lot of other games to go. So, um, but, you know, we're, we're invested in Coach Trailer and he's invested in us, so we're just going to keep on going. He just reassured us, hey, things are going to happen. He's a, he's a really good coach in a, uh, in a very predominant role. And, of course, people are going to call his name, especially when we're winning. So it, makes, it just makes a lot of sense. All right, the extra week will help the Roadrunners prepare for their biggest challenge when they have to travel to El Paso to meet up with UTEP one week from this Saturday at 9.15 p.m. night San Antonio time. When the Texas Longhorns resume their season this Saturday in Waco, they'll be just two and a half point underdogs against the 16th ranked Baylor Bears. The Horns will be coming off a bye week following back to back losses to Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, where in both cases, their lead. They had the lead only to lose the game. As much of the bye week has been working on the team's mentality of holding those leads, what has the coaching staff done for starting quarterback Casey Thompson with some extra time to improve his reads against defenses? Our job is to put him in the best position to have success. And if that means, hey, we, we're practicing to play maybe more times throughout a week than we normally would to ensure that he feels really good about it, regardless of the coverage we get, um, you know, that, that's a win. So those are, those are some of the things that we're trying to work on with him to get that done. All right, you can see the Longhorns and the Bears live on KSAT 12 this Saturday starting at 11 a.m. Hey, here we go. The KSAT 12 Texas Sports Productions Game of the Week features the number one ranked Brennan Bears against the Holmes Huskies. The Bears will be looking to stay the top ranked team in the city, undefeated, averaging 52 and a half points a game in district competition with dual threat quarterback Ashton DuBose, who has 1,789 yards and 27 touchdowns in the air and another seven on the ground. While Holmes is fighting to make the playoffs right now with a five and three overall record is one win out right behind quarterback Christopher Medelez, who has 1,216 yards and 11 touchdowns. We take it very seriously. We got to take it week by week and don't underestimate any team and be dominant on the field and that's it. We know they're good, but like we know what, what we can play. Like as a team, we come together and play. Like we'll be able to beat them, but like we just had like we just happened to be, uh, be able to play together. All right, here is the matchup: number one Brendan Bears against the Holmes Huskies Thursday at 7 p.m. from Gustafson Stadium. And by the way, that will be on KSAT 12.2 digital broadcast. Look forward to that one. This the season's coming down; only two oh, yeah. weeks left. Jockeying for playoff position. You got or it. just playoffs or just playoff <laughs> period. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is coming up next. We're talking about billions of dollars in a bond and a major resignation that happened just one week ago. We are joined by Mayor of San Antonio, Ron Nuremberg, now to talk about hopefully as many of those things as we can hit in the next five or six minutes. Mr. Mayor, appreciate you being with us as always. Talk about, first off, your reaction to Paula Gold Williams deciding to step down as CEO and president of CPS Energy. 
Well, CPS Energy uh, has been for the last 75 years one of the largest and strongest municipal utilities in the nation. And obviously, it's critically important to the future of San Antonio. Uh, we are in good position uh, to uh, retain that. And we uh, obviously are thankful to Paula for her leadership over the last several years. Uh, we are going to continue to move forward to ensure that CPS Energy remains strong for the owners which are the public citizens of San Antonio. You know, CPS Energy and Paula Gold Williams as its leader taken a lot of criticism since that February freeze uh, for what happened during those days and really in, in the months afterward. We know that there is a potential 10% rate increase on the table. Do you think her resignation has any effect on that or the timing of it? So, first of all, there are things that we can control and there are things we can't control. Um, you know, the pandemic was something that was extremely challenging for every public agency in the country. Uh, the winter storm here in Texas challenged every utility uh, in the state. Uh, with regard to the rate increase, um, what, what has been floated out there, the 10% uh, proposal and everything, that is not uh, something that we're discussing right now in terms of the actual number of the rate increase. In fact, the city staff and our CFO, Ben Gorzell, does an analysis to determine what are the needs, what are the revenue needs for this publicly owned utility. That analysis is still underway, so it is definitely premature to be talking about any number of a rate increase and the timeline. So we're going to continue to do that work. Uh, ben and his team, which are, you know, I would consider some of the sharpest financial minds in the nation, are going to continue to do that work to ensure that CPS is a strong utility and that the public has uh the, the 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 great service it expects uh but it is too early right now to be talking about a specific number i do not expect it to be in the 10 percent range uh if at all talk about uh the fact that in our bear facts uh case at san antonio report poll cps energy you know was in the 60s and 70 percent approval rating before what happened last february since then they've they haven't even got the 50 percent did right. this have to happen? Did new leadership have to come into CPS to kind of change that perception of the public, whether it's reality or not? You know, I think there's a lot of expectations uh, on every public agency and CPS, especially uh, with regard to uh, the disruptions that have occurred during the pandemic. And then, of course, during the winter storm. Uh, and like I said, there are things that we can control. There are things that we can't control. There are mistakes that have been made. Uh, with regard to information and coordination that um, we uh, addressed and identified in the committee I established to look at the emergency response that took place. That's exactly why I appointed that committee to identify the challenges and the things that we did well, the things that uh, we didn't do well. And so uh, we're going to we're going to fix those things and make sure that the CPS is in the right position moving forward. But that is that is absolutely the charge of the next leadership of, of CPS Energy, and that's what we're gonna hold uh, them to account. The city is considering using millions of dollars to help out residents who are behind on their utility bills. A lot of people in that situation related to hardships having to do with the pandemic. Talk about where that money is coming from and if that is something that you are going to support. Yes, so the pandemic we know has um, created a huge impact on families all across this country and especially here in San Antonio. One of those impacts has been uh, people are having uh, difficulty because they've been laid off or uh, work has been stopped uh, in paying rent, mortgage and utilities. And so we have developed some of the strongest assistance programs in the nation. Uh, and we also have to work with our utilities, SAWS and CPS, to help with folks who haven't been able to pay their utility bills because they haven't had any income. That, of course, is not the case for everyone, uh, but there are still a large number of residents who, uh, because of um, this pandemic, are uh, still struggling to get back to even with their utility bills. And so the ARPA dollars, which were allocated from the federal government, were expressly um, allocated for the purpose of getting people back on their feet to help us through recovery and to ultimately get on with a uh, restart of our economy. So I do support the use of some ARPA dollars to help with that process, to get uh, folks who have been most impacted by the pandemic 
uh, in, in particular, the utility bills back on their feet and have a soft landing. So that's something that we're going to continue to discuss. But uh, I am pleased with the proposal that city staff put forward already. Final question for you when we're talking about the, the, the billions of dollars that will potentially go into this next bond. We did a story today on the trail system and the fact that the original proposal was lessened today so more money can go to infrastructure projects. I want to make yeah. sure we clarify in this whole thing, though. That is not in any way delaying or taking anything away from the trail system and the plan for the next 20 or so years, correct? Uh, that's correct. And and so the important thing to note is that the Creekway trail system, which is one of the most important and popular programs we've ever done, is still in development. And we have an initial vision that still requires about 10 years of investment, but it's going to grow. And so we're going to continue to allocate dollars um, with the vote of the public towards that. And the recommendation from the city staff, which is $110 million of the $1.2 billion of the bond program coming up, will help us to stay on track. Of course, we're going to have to stay committed to it in the future, but this allocation in this bond will help us to do that. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, thanks for your time. Thanks for sharing some with us here this evening. Have a great night. Y'all. We'll be right back. We'll go back some construction uh, around the area to tell you about. Uh, first, up here in uh, Comal County, FM 306 to the South Guadalupe River, there will be some southbound lane closures uh, starting at 9 uh, down south to the, uh, the Guadalupe River. As I mentioned, they're doing some uh, paving work there. Also, this is on the schedule ramp closure here from 35 northbound to Pat Booker Road. Also, some other closures in that area also kicking off at 9. Alternating lane closures again to 81 to Stone Oak Parkway on Loop 1604. Uh, seeing some delays still there, 26 minutes westbound from 281 to I-10. Speaking of I-10, we still have this situation uh, close to 410. There's a crash at Hebner that's causing some delays. 43 minutes uh, right now to get from downtown to Bernie, guys. Thank you, Samuel. For the first time, officials addressing in public questions about that fatal shooting on Alec Baldwin's movie set in New Mexico. They said the possibility of criminal charges is still on the table, but that the investigation is ongoing. ABC's Rena Roy tells us about the evidence collected so far. An intricate investigation underway on the movie set Rust in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Authorities collecting 600 pieces of evidence, including three firearms and 500 rounds of blank, dummy and apparent live ammunition. We're going to determine how those got there, why they were there, because they shouldn't have been there. The question is, how did it get there? That in and of itself is negligence. The question is going to be who was responsible. Police say Alec Baldwin fatally shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins Thursday with a Colt Long revolver while rehearsing for a scene. And if the sheriff's office determines during our investigation a crime has occurred and probable cause exists, an arrest or arrests will be made and charges will be filed. Investigators believe that bullet first hit Hutchins before lodging into director Joel Souza's shoulder. The projectile was recovered by medical personnel and turned over to the sheriff's office as evidence. Officials explain the armorer had prepared the gun, then the assistant director handed it to Baldwin yelling cold gun, meaning it should have been empty, but it was in fact loaded. The AD telling authorities he was not aware of that. A cast member telling TMZ he feared for his safety when filming gun battle scenes. When they shot at me, um, I actually did feel the blanks hitting my face and my body. And um, I could feel the wind from the shotgun, you know, being discharged. The sheriff's department and district attorney's office now interviewing cast and crew members on set. It could be weeks or even months until authorities decide if a crime occurred that warrants an arrest or any charges. Investigators looking at every angle and every piece of evidence very closely. Producers of the movie have also hired their own lawyers to conduct a separate investigation, according to an internal letter obtained by ABC. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Loving these temperatures. Feels nice and fall-like out there, but this wind is something else. Yes. And let me tell you, I bought balloons today. Oh boy, that must have been interesting. Yeah. If, think about me trying to get those in my car with this <laughs> yeah. wind. 
I, I hope there's Is there video. video? That's, I hope that's there is. I hope. That would be awesome. It was at HEB in a parking lot, so it's somebody was a witness to that. Yeah, I can, yeah. that's the first thing I was thinking. Boop, <laughs> just knocking into each it other, knocking you around. For several minutes. <laughs> that's good stuff. And tomorrow's not a good day to buy balloons either. Yeah. Let me just Noted. Got it. Throw that out there. <laughs> Myra, you couldn't wait a day or two. Uh, you know, it's okay. You got to get it done. Yeah. That's right. So, Jacket weather at the bus stop tomorrow morning. It's going to be another windy day tomorrow. We just established that low humidity all the way through the weekend. Those are our main headlines and nothing but sunshine as well. I want to talk a little bit about a rainfall. We picked up about an inch last or not last night early this morning before sunrise. And since October 1st, we've had over six and a half inches. And so month to date rainfall is more than three inches above average. As for year to date, we've had about 32 and a half inches of precipitation. Note, I always say precipitation because that includes our February snowfall, the liquid equivalent of that. And we're about four and a half inches above average for year to date precipitation. Of course, measured at the airport, the official climate site here in town. 60 this morning, or that was our low temperature, then 78 this afternoon. Notice the average 79. We're going to be running a little below that for a few days. The record high 91 set back in 1980 and even our average low of 57 will be well below that by a good 10 degrees over the next couple of days. So let's talk temperatures. We're all feeling the cooler weather across the state. 60s off to the north 67 in Lubbock. Dallas at 67. Meanwhile, still hanging on to the 80s farther south. 83 Catula, 84 Laredo and Corpus Christi at 82. But as we go through the night, temperatures falling off and we're thinking by tomorrow morning, this is what the map is going to look like. 44 in Kerrville, Canyon Lake 47, 50 in Gonzales, 42. However, in Fredericksburg, you get to Bernie 47, Seguin 49, Timberwood Park 49. So some locations just dipping down into the 40s to start the day tomorrow and lower 50s in the south side of Bear County. So Von Army, Elmendorf 52, even Lavernia 51. Temperatures drop off even more. If you like it even cooler in the mornings, Friday 47, Saturday 46, and even cooler than that in the hill country and outlying areas. Morning temperatures rebound a little bit as we get into next week, a little closer to 60 degrees. That's with a return of a little bit of humidity in the air. So here's the big picture. Cold front swept through early this morning. Big upper level trough, the big dip in the upper level flow stretching from Canada all the way down into Texas and the Gulf of Mexico, stirring up all this active weather up and down the midsection of the country. That's moving eastward, clearing out of our area. It's out of here. We were on the tail end of the showers and storms, but enough to pick up about an inch around a good portion of Bear County and surrounding counties as well. It's out of here. Now we've been dealing with the wind. Not a good day to buy balloons uh, today or tomorrow. If you can avoid it, do it in the morning. That's the best way to put it. Do it in the morning when it's not as windy. Still gusty out there now, gusting up to 30 miles per hour. But tonight the wind's going to subside a bit. Tomorrow morning at sunrise, maybe some gusts around 15 miles per hour. By the afternoon, however, we'll see those gusts back closer to 35 miles per hour. So another gusty day tomorrow. It's going to be very similar, but temperatures a little bit cooler. So this evening, not as gusty, not as breezy, a northwesterly wind at 5 to 15, down into the 50s by midnight. Tomorrow morning near 50, but we talked about those temperatures. They'll be in the 40s and outlying areas. 77 by the afternoon, and we'll be in the 70s every afternoon through Saturday. Trick-or-treating weather, very agreeable, good for any kind of costume. I only lost one balloon. Really? There was, yeah. There that, was that's one, amazing. One man down in the car door. Yeah, it was, yeah. Oh, you popped one. Yeah, one popped. Mm -hmm. It was like it got caught. Yeah. Pulled and, yeah. I think that's a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. As you can imagine, lots to talk about this morning. Good morning to you. It's Wednesday, the 27th. First at five, another update on that deadly crash in Kerrville at a drag racing event over the weekend. We have now learned that a third person is dead. The Bear County Medical Examiner tells us 46 year old Rebecca Cedillo of Converse passed away at University Hospital. She was taken there on Saturday following the crash and at the time was listed in critical condition. 
Right now, a funeral service for one of the victims, eight-year-old Santiago Martinez, underway on the city's south side. A man is dead, a woman in the hospital after a shooting and crash on the east side overnight. According to San Antonio police, witnesses told investigators the man driving erratically around 1 a.m. on I-10 near Foster Road before the truck hit a light pole. Investigators say a woman who was sitting in the passenger seat had been shot. She was taken to the hospital in critical condition. The 26 year old driver found dead behind the wheel. Investigators believe he died of a self inflicted gunshot wound. The FDA now considering whether to authorize the Pfizer vaccine for children ages 5 to 11 after its advisory panel voted to recommend that. The FDA now expected to authorize officially giving the vaccine to children in this age group and then the medicine will start shipping all across the country. Scientists say approving the vaccine is keeping kids safe. At least 6 million Americans under 18 years old have gotten sick with COVID since the pandemic began. A fall-like stretch of weather in place. We're going to be near 50 in the morning. Next several afternoons, really in the mid to upper 70s, back in the low 80s by Halloween. Nothing but sunshine throughout, but Halloween trick-or-treating weather. I'm anticipating mid-upper 70s around sunset and even thereafter and low humidity. So good, Steve, for the Chewbacca costume, as you always <laughs> That's say. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you don't want the little kids to have, like, you yeah, know, too hot. heavy costumes. <laughs> I speak Wookiee. Oh, wow. It's a message. We saved the best for last. Yes, we did. A message to all the